Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Growing and Funding Equitable Food Hubs, a strategy for improving access to healthy food. My name is Allison Hagee. I'm an Associate Director at PolicyLink, and I will be moderating today's webinar. We are delighted that you're all able to join us today, and I look forward to a very interesting conversation. So just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. This webinar will be recorded and an archive will be available. We'll send a link to the archive to all the participants today and we'll also post it on the Healthy Food Access Portal. We're going to leave some time at the end of today's presentation to answer any questions you may have and you can go ahead and use the chat feature on the side of your screen to submit questions at any time. And finally, at the very end of the presentation, there will be a pop-up survey, a very short one. We definitely appreciate your feedback about the webinar, and also feel free to use it to send suggestions for other topics that you'd like to see covered. Next. We are hosting this webinar as a feature of the Healthy Food Access Portal, an endeavor that is a partnership of PolicyLink, the Food Trust, and the Reinvestment Fund all groups that are working to promote and increase access to healthy food. And the portal is supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. PolicyLink is a national research and action institute advancing economic and social equity by lifting up what works. The Food Trust is a nonprofit founded in 1992 to make healthy food available to all by working with neighborhoods, schools, grocers, farmers, and policymakers to develop a comprehensive approach that combines nutrition education and greater availability of affordable, healthy food. The Reinvestment Fund is a community development financial institution serving the Mid-Atlantic region and national leader in rebuilding America's distressed towns and cities. We encourage all of you to visit the Healthy Food Access Portal to get more information on equitable food hubs and other healthy food access topics. We'll be having more webinars in the upcoming months, so definitely check out the portal for those dates. In the short term, expect a September webinar on statewide advocacy programs. And in October, we will have a webinar on financing basics and working with community development financial institutions. Next. We have a remarkable group of experts lined up today. These are leaders in the food hub world who are managing successful food hubs while keeping equity front and center in their operations. They're serving low-income communities and communities of color and supporting farmers. And they are demonstrating that an equitable food hub can be a sustainable and successful model. So first up, we have Hailey Johnson, a Philadelphia-based social entrepreneur who works to improve the vitality of rural and urban communities through food systems reform and policy change. As a father of three, Hailey actively pursues his core purpose to repair the earth for our children and prepare our children for the earth. Along with his wife, Tatiana, he's the co-director and a founder of the Common Market Philadelphia, a nonprofit distribution enterprise that connects communities in the mid-Atlantic region to sustainable, locally grown farm food. The two have also teamed up to found the East Park Revitalization Alliance in their community of Strawberry Mansion, where they've resided for 11 years. Steve Saltzman leads Self-Help Healthy Food Systems Initiative, from lending to organizational strategy. He's responsible for more than $200 million in community development financing for projects supporting healthy food systems, education, commercial real estate, and downtown redevelopment, twinning self-help funding with public and private financing, equity and cre credit enhancement, ranging from new markets tax credits and historic tax credits to USDA loan guarantees. Prior to self-help, he helped found two venture capital background technology companies. Lyndon Thayer is a self-help healthy food system consultant and a doctoral candidate in nutrition intervention and policy at UNC Chapel Hill. Lyndon has spent the better part of a decade working with schools and communities to improve child and family health with food system business to promote people, planet, and profit, and with the incredible interdisciplinary teams that believe health and healthy food are human rights. Her goal is to make the healthy choice the easy choice. And finally, we have Chris Brown, who served as Executive Director of the Agriculture and Land-Based Training Association, ALBA, since 2012. 
Prior to that, Chris spent 13 years in the international nonprofit field managing U.S. government-funded rural economic development projects in the Ukraine, Romania, Montenegro, and the Republic of Georgia. And immediately prior to joining ALBA, he led a research project based in Washington, D.C., studying how to link small farmers to market opportunities in Mongolia and Rwanda. And after 14 years away, Chris was delighted to return to his native California to apply this experience towards helping aspiring farmers establish organic farming businesses. Next. What has us most excited about food hubs is really their ability to connect and strengthen the local food system, to bridge food producers and their consumers, providing a mutually beneficial relationship at both ends of the food system. And this link is critical, connecting small and mid-sized farmers to markets that have historically been unable to access, while also increasing the amount of fresh, local, and high-quality foods, reaching nearby urban, suburban, and rural communities. And food hubs in particular have the potential to create a more equitable food system that values fair wages and employment opportunities, healthy food access, local economic growth, and small business development, and sustainable agriculture. Food hubs, particularly those designed with equity in mind, provide an abundance of opportunities for growers and producers, aggregators, distributor, distributors, and the consumer. And as you can see from the slides, we have several resources on the Healthy Food Access Portal website and on the Policy Link website. On the left is a Policy Link Equitable Development online tool on Equitable Food Hubs. The middle resource is basically a screenshot of all the information on food hubs on the Healthy Food Access Portal. And on the right of your screen, you'll see an in-depth case study that Policy Link worked on about common market. And with that, this is a great way to punt to Hailey Johnston, who is the co-founder and co-director of Common Market. Thank you so much, Allison. I really appreciate it. And I, uh, I especially want to thank our amazing local partners here that we have in Philadelphia uh, in the Food Trust and the REIT Investment Fund, uh, as well as uh, PolicyLink and Pyramid Communications for the great work they did on, uh, on our case study. And of course, thanking RWJ for supporting the, the portal and, and our other panelists. Um, again, my name is Hailey Johnston. Uh, and you can maybe go to the next slide. I'm a founder and co-director of The Common Mar Market. Uh, we are a nonprofit distributor of sustainably sourced local farm food uh, in the Mid-Atlantic region. And our mission is really to expand access of good food to all people, and with a particular focus on underserved communities, while improving the viability of family farms in our region. Next slide, please. And to, uh, to get a sense of common market, you really have to know where we came from uh, and how our origins and our beginning uh, really emanated from an equity focus. Uh, common market initiated originally from conversations that we were having about how we impact food access in our own community. Uh, again, Strawberry Mansion neighborhood in North Philadelphia. Uh, Strawberry Mansion is this incredible, beautiful, historic neighborhood uh, with uh, the highest percentage of African Americans in the city of Philadelphia, and one of uh, some of the highest incidents of chronic disease uh, in the nation. Um, and while a beautiful uh, community rich in heritage, it, it certainly has challenges. Uh, Tatiana and I uh, were working in our own community with, alongside our neighbors, um, working to improve uh, the health and well-being of, of youth in our neighborhood. We were very much determined to figure out how we create a community where all children th thrive and where we would want to raise our own children. Um, it, again, it's considered a food desert, not because necessarily there's a lack of access to food, but there certainly is a lack of access to good food. And, uh, and because of that lack of access, uh, the disparities are really, really a place a heavy burden on everyone in our community. Next slide, please. And so what we did is we began to think about what was a possible intervention that we could create that could work on a systems level scale. Uh, and what was born through our work with partners in our region is this vision for connecting rural communities uh, that were suffering because of lack of access to market uh, directly to low income and other communities in our region uh, that were suffering because of a lack of access to food. Um, from the very beginning, our focus was on scale. 
how do we scale the work we do to impact, uh, you know, really scale the impact on the communities we serve, uh, both in urban and rural places. Next slide, please. So what that often means is that the food that we're sourcing from over 80 sustainable family farms in our region uh, makes it into the kitchens in our region's institutions, uh, in the anchors, anchor institutions that serve many of the vul vulnerable communities that we seek to uh, support. So places like hospital and this hospitals, this is a photo of Cooper University Hospital across the river in New Jersey, which um, has one of the lowest uh, income uh, is actually one of the lowest income cities in the nation. Next slide, please. So we work with a variety of institutional food service, uh, hospitals, schools, elder care, as well as with markets. And many of the markets that we serve were actually funded by Healthy Food Financing Initiative Funds, or HFFI, um, and Fresh Food Financing Initiative Funds um, that were uh, in many ways piloted here in our region, Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. And those markets uh, were established in communities that are uh, food deserts and where people really struggle to access good food. Next slide, please. This is a graphical de depiction of the work that we do. Common Market, again, is uh, acts as a distributor or a hub. We are the only entity that handles the food between the farmer and the, the institution or the customer in many cases. Um, and for us, um, we work and we really strive to return as much of the food dollar to the farmer uh, while making food accessible and affordable uh, to the communities we're trying to serve. Um, for us, equity in the food system really has everything to do with uh, fair and transparent processes uh, and the notion of distributed benefit. So what Common Market is always trying to do is distribute benefit to the two anchors of the food system. Uh, again, uh, the growers and the consumers. Next slide, please. And everything we do is rooted in our values. Uh, our first value, of course, uh, being community because common markets work emanated from the community where we live. Um, trying to find the ways to, um, to, to, again, distribute as much benefit to low-income communities uh, in both urban and rural settings. Next slide, please. A big part of our work is also related to stewardship. As we've grown, we've seen the impact that expanded focus on sustainable agriculture can have on our regional ecology. And so what we're trying to do is be good stewards of our region, good stewards of the ecological health of our community. And we firmly believe that that has a, has a profound impact, especially in uh, low-income marginalized communities. Um, so we, we try to uh, grow the demand for sustainably grown food, uh, and by doing so, uh, in, in increase the number of farmers who are growing food with an ecological focus. Next slide, please. Safety, in general, is one of our most important values as well. Uh, what we're trying to do is heal people through food and um, making sure that there is a high level of accountability and transparency in every step of our distribution process from the field and the farm worker all the way to the consumer making sure that food is handled in a way that, again, keeps people healthy and thriving. Next slide, please. And finally, local investment. Um, trying to divert as much of, or, or, and keep as much of our, our local food spend within institutions and other markets uh, local so that uh, our food dollars actually go back into our economy, creating jobs on the farm side as well as um, Within, within the communities that we serve. Next slide, please. And because this is a webinar that's focused on uh, capital and, and um, social enterprise, I, I really want to share this graph. Uh, this graph demonstrates common markets, annual growth uh, by month. And one of the things that I think is most telling is the opportunity uh, that has been created uh, with, within common market uh, for growth of impact on our communities. And that opportunity was really enabled by an access to capital. Uh, and if you look at this, at this chart, you see uh, there's a place where um, our sales growth begins to narrow, uh, and which is depicted by the red line there. Um, 
we really broke out of that low growth period uh, with the completion of the acquisition and renovation of our facility, which was uh, supported by RSF Social Finance. And it was that expanded capacity that really unlocked uh, the potential uh, impact that we have uh, and the growth uh, in our organization. Um, so it's, uh, you know, the funding of social enterprise uh, organizations that, are, that have equity focus, that are trying to improve health and well-being in communities is, is critical, uh, absolutely critical. It's that access to capital that I think really creates the opportunity for scaled impact. Next slide, please. Um, our growth drivers for the coming year uh, are really us continuing to focus within institutional food service, uh, within retail, and within direct-to-consumer programs like FarmShare. Uh, some of the things that have also driven growth in the last year, and we see huge opportunities in, in uh, coming years as well, is the work that we're doing directly within communities, expanding access through community-based organizations. So whether they be faith communities or, or nonprofit local organizations, um, we feel like our being able to channel the, the, the highest quality food grown in our region into the communities that need it most is going to have the greatest impact on population health outcomes in our region. Uh, and we're also expanding uh, the work that we do regionally uh, as there, there really is a, a loud and clear call for partnership uh, with Common Market and others who are providing this kind of food. Next slide, please. So one of the things I like to share is like this sort of victory stance. Uh, this is actually my, my daughter and my nephew uh, in the garden across the street from our, our, our house. Um, and, and this is the energy, the, the kind of exuberance for good food that we're trying to create in, in really in all communities, but especially in communities like Strawberry Mansion, uh, really changing people's relationship with food, helping them connect back to the earth, and uh, realize the vitality uh, that can be created from a job. A, a job and economic benefit perspective as well as population health benefits by embracing good food um, and, uh, and knowing where your food comes from. Next slide, please. And if ever anyone wants to reach directly out to Common Market, uh, if you have any questions, if you uh, have a vision for uh, how you would like to build a, a stronger regional food system, we're always available to answer any questions and uh, we Greatly appreciate your time, and, and uh, thank you for joining this webinar today. With that, I'm going to pass uh, on to Steve Saltzman at Self Help. Thank you so much. Thanks, Hailey. And whenever we're on a dais with uh, Alba and Common Market, I, I think Self Help's usually doing something uh, right. So we're we're really pleased to uh, be here, and we're a sister organization to the Reinvestment Fund. We are also a community development financial institution. We're also a community development credit union, the largest one in the country. We have 20 retail branches in North Carolina, another 20 in California, three in Chicago. Uh, we lend nationally uh, to healthy food system projects, whether it's a food hub, a grocery store. Uh, we also do low-income housing, schools, commercial redevelopment. And I think when we, while we're talking about all our lending and our retail branches, I think everybody at Self-Help, our more than 500 employees, I think everyone thinks of themselves as working for a civil rights organization. And our lending is very much predicated on trying to provide responsible financial services to people of color, women, and rural residents. And we think healthy food systems really speaks to the core of our mission. Our theory about how we're going to do social change works in two ways. We don't believe that we can lend enough to have the impact that we want. So we collaborate closely with partners, whether it's the Food Trust, PolicyLink, uh, research institutions like the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill School of Public Health, or Duke University's School of Public Policy and its Nicholas School of the Environment to sort of understand what are the policy interventions uh, that can be gleaned from our portfolio of loans. But when we think about lending to a food hub or really any project, we, I have this little depiction of a bicycle. We think about the balance that you need in a project. If the front wheel is mission and the back wheel is financial sustainability, both have to be present. If you think about common market, for example, if Highly was focused on nothing but social mission and had complete disregard for financial viability, he could pedal like crazy 
but not get anywhere. By the same token, if Hiley was trying to maximize profits to the exclusion of everything else, he could be the strongest cyclist in the world and do nothing but pedal in circles. So when we look at food system projects, whether it's a food hub or a grocery store or any other food project and that we're doing, uh, whether it's Detroit, Savannah, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, Gary, Indiana, we sort of look for a series of mission outcomes on the front end. Job creation in low resource neighborhoods is, is very much primary to us. We also look at trying to create wealth, allowing small and medium sized farmers to capture more of the surplus value of their labor. Everybody on this webinar is, I'm sure, well versed in the public health importance of creating access to healthy food. And so I won't belabor that, but to say we have several public health grad students on staff here um, that help us understand which of these food system projects can really improve public health and maybe which ones don't. And uh, we like to collaborate with our other partners to get at that. In terms of investment strategy, I think we always try to figure out you know, what woman or man is leading the project? You know, because it's, it's a cliche, but we try to bet on the jockey, not the horse. And we try to find innovative leaders, especially for projects like these that are very new and that the business models are different. When you hear about Alba and then you look at common market, their business models are different. Their pricing models, their sales strategies, their, cons their customer base is different. But we try to we try to understand what are the common threads of what we consider to be these high mission, highly successful projects. And we also try to understand what are the common elements of the ones that don't work and that we can be on the lookout for it. And collaborating with people like the reinvestment fund is very important to us so that we can share what are the common traits of these really game-changing projects. And lastly, I mean, we want our borrowers to have equity into every project that they can't be entirely philanthropy-driven projects. To us, if a project isn't financially viable, we question, really, what is, the social, what is the policy impact of it? Well, many of you may be saying, what is a national credit union like lending to food ups? What does that have to do with the civil rights movement? You know, as highly talked about, we think that food hubs are really important to strengthen low-resource neighborhoods if they're located there. And when, while well, Hiley's talking about all of his customers, if you walk in that neighborhood where common market is, it's impossible not to be moved by the secondary and third and tertiary uh, community development benefits of him locating there. And the idea that he's expanding with his team is, is only good. We've already talked about uh, the public health aspects. Low resource neighborhoods, getting more healthy food in there is incredibly important. When Hiley spoke about the energy and the vitality, that hits at one of our strategies. Our theory of social change about obesity, childhood obesity, and about food deserts and food swamps is it's really important to get access to good food, but we also want to get the bad food out. Getting people to eat more broccoli in and of itself is not sufficient to our mind. And we think that food hubs become incredible organizing instruments to create food activists in their communities to say, you know, these fast food restaurants are not our friends. The agricultural impact for us is something that we look at very closely with our partners at the Center for Environmental Farming Systems at North Carolina State University. Not only is it important that we have food traveling as little distance as possible because it's healthier, but also because of the energy savings, and I'm sure everybody in this webinar understands the incredible climate change implications by having people getting their food from as close, uh, as close by as possible. Highly spoke about food safety, and that's something as an organization that we look at with every investment in a food project uh, that we make. I'm going to talk about an investment we made in a food hub that's different than the way that Common Market is organized and that Alba Farms is. A year and a half ago, we went to a food hub called Eastern Carolina Organics. It was started with a $40,000 grant from the Tobacco Land Trust to try to get North Carolina's rural tobacco farmers to convert to growing organic food. What's unique about Eastern Carolina Organics is that it's also cooperatively owned by 15 of the most active growers and that they pay their farmers 80 cents on the dollar as opposed to the 50 cents 
that it happens in a conventional food distributorship. Well, Eco up to this year, it sold $17 million worth of produce, 13 million of that going to small and medium-sized farmers in rural North Carolina. Well, we lent Eco money a year and a half ago to build a warehouse in a low-resource neighborhood. Since then, they have been in July, their revenue number was twice their previous high from the year before, almost a million dollars in a single month. They doubled their workforce, providing everybody full health and dental insurance. And this is a neighborhood that desperately needed the jobs. They're also providing below market rent to four other sustainable food businesses. So we're starting to get a lot of collective energy. None of these food businesses on their own probably could have afforded whether it's uh, be, the, be able to move the produce with the pallets or being able to own a loading dock, but together they all can. Since Eastern Carolina has located in this neighborhood, other businesses are now thinking that this very low resource neighborhood in Durham may be a good one for them to move to as well. One of the things that we want to move to now is a pilot project that we're starting in a school. And before we cue to the video, I think this is a real opportunity for communities to think of schools as food hubs they, as a, maybe a third way, where common market may have been the second phase of food hubs after CSAs. We wonder whether these institutions in and of themselves uh, can provide a lot of energy. Let's go ahead and cue the video, please. Over the summer of 2014, Self-Help developed an innovative strategy for improving the eating habits of students in a low-resource community in rural North Carolina. The program is called SPOON, Student Power Over Our Nutrition. The first experiment of the SPOON concept was in Henderson, a town with a population of less than 16,000 people and a median household income of around $25,000. The SPOON approach is multifaceted and involves educating a small student committee of the benefits of healthy eating. Two times a week, for three weeks, members of the self-help team visited the SPOON student committee at Henderson Collegiate. Each class consisted of a lesson on important food facts. A brainstorming session designed to give the students an active say in the food that would eventually be on their school cafeteria menu. I'm excited about the mango salsa tilapia because that's like a new food to me and I would like to try different foods. And fun and games like a blind taste test. Oh, this one is funky. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, the, taste. <laughs> <laughs> the taste is good. I'm just not sure you're going to be able to figure it out. The visits culminated with the students cooking a meal and sitting together family style to enjoy what they made. Um, most foods that I've never tried was the uh, peanut butter noodles. I really like it. The next step for Spoon students is to design a marketing campaign to share what they learned with the rest of the student body and encourage adoption of healthy eating in the school cafeteria. The hope is that Spoon students will meet weekly to maintain active participation in school meals and community-wide nutrition and food system activities. We are actually a part of the committee, so we're going to change the lunch menu. We reviewed some of the health options, and we're going to make more options for people to eat because we know not everybody eats the same thing. The ultimate goal is to push Spoon out to other schools and use it to understand how food systems education and direct engagement of students can improve health and the environment community-wide. So self-help really sees uh, collaborations with our borrowers as potential learning laboratories for social change and innovation. And um, working with schools like Henderson Collegiate uh, really afford us an opportunity to understand what works and what doesn't in the, when we're talking about building healthy food systems. And with great examples like Common Market and like Eco, um, what is it exactly we're hoping to learn from working with schools? And for self-help, we really see schools
schools and institutions like schools, hospitals, prisons, as a huge opportunity um, when we're talking about food hubs and food systems. And they could potentially be a key player when we're moving forward into the next wave of healthy food systems. So when we're thinking about schools and we're thinking about food hubs, they each bring strengths and weaknesses um, to a food system, but we think that those strengths and weaknesses really are quite complementary when schools and food hubs either support each other in working together or perhaps in the future when we blend the two into one entity. And so just as an example, we have many, many uh, things listed here. I'll just name two. But for example, schools need a large and consistent supply, which is often considered a barrier when it comes to engaging in local food, farm to school, and other such programs. Um, but food hubs provide an opportunity to really aggregate from those small and mid-sized farmers um, enough produce to supply those large school uh, cafeterias who really are the largest restaurants in many communities. And by the same token, um, schools really have very limited labor hours to serve hundreds of meals in a matter of minutes. And so food hubs, again, present an opportunity to do flash freezing, minimal prep of various kinds, to provide easier to use local fresh products in the school system. On the other side, we have food hub challenges and school solutions. And just as one example, food hubs, when we're talking about using them as a way to really address social inequities, um, need to be located in those low-resource, high-risk communities. And schools provide a, an opportunity to engage with an institution and structures that are already in place in a variety of settings, including those re low-resource communities. So with Spoon, we really we're thinking of, of our pilot with Spoon as a three-pronged approach. We had short, medium, and long-term goals. And we went into Henderson Collegiate, that charter school, with, with an understanding that we really needed to unleash pent-up demand, but we had no idea what was waiting for us. Within 30 minutes of sitting down with some of the folks at Henderson Collegiate, we met with a 55-year-old black rural uh, janitor from Henderson, North Carolina, who said to us, look, I have diabetes. My family has heart disease. Our community is suffering. And so whatever exciting programs you're going to bring to this school in terms of food and food systems, I want to see that taken out to the parents, to the families, and to our larger community. That pent-up demand was there, but obviously we needed to do capacity building um, and some basic education, which is certainly not sufficient, but was a part of our you know, first step. Then moving into the medium term, we're looking at building student leadership because we really see those students as being the keys to change um, for healthier food systems in the future. And starting to incorporate, of course, uh, sourcing from local producers, whether that's from an eco, a common market, or some new entities that we work um, together to build um, a stronger community there. And then, of course, Self-Help really understands that in the long term, all of our, our exciting pilot programs um, and programmatic opportunities aren't enough. In the long term, we need local, state, and federal policy that's really going to address both um, access to unhealthy foods as well as access to healthy foods. Thank you for letting us share some of our work. For those of you out there in the webinar that are looking at exciting projects or have food hubs uh, uh, that are emerging or expanding, uh, we're going to go on the road this, uh, uh, this fall, and we'd love to come see them. If you'd like to have more information about Spoon, we're happy to share our resources and our research fellows with you. So please feel free to contact uh, Lyndon or myself. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Steve. And um, I don't believe I have slide control here quite yet. So I'll just say next when I need the slides advanced. Um, yeah, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Lyndon and Haley. It's it's um, great to be here, and um, always interesting to learn more about programs that have a similar focus to us. Um, Steve did mention uh, that um, you know we have different business models here, and and I will stress that we, we look at things more from a farmer development perspective rather than a food access um, perspective. We we do have a couple of small distinct projects focusing on food access, one in farmers markets where we um, subsidize um, uh, um, purchases of, uh, of fresh produce in farmers markets in 10 different um, markets on the central coast. Um, we also bring kids, oh there's my access. 
We also bring, also bring kids from um, a local school district here to teach them about sustainable agriculture, the importance of farming in the area. Um, but mostly, the thrust of our activity is on um, our food hub activities on providing market access um, to uh, the farmers that we're trying to support. Um, so uh, we're really working from the supply side there. You see some of our farmers out in the field. Let's see, do I have? There it is. Okay. Next slide, please. There it is. So, and we're going to uh, get a little more granular here um, and, and kind of pull back the curtain on what we're thinking we've been doing on, on our food uh, hub activity. Um, we're really looking into a lot of issues uh, to restructure it and make it more efficient, less costly to reach markets, and ultimately more profitable for our farmers to reach markets because we're trying to um, make them successful and independent um, and create models for others to follow. Um, so as, as you know, our mission basically is to help farmers, our farmers, establish and grow their organic farming businesses. 80% um, are low income Latinos, many of them immigrants um, who have Spanish or even indigenous language as their first language. Um, at least 30% are women. And the, uh, the ages range wild, uh, pretty widely from 20 to 50 with an average probably in the, the early 30s. So we are trying to establish, you know, a new generation of of farmers here. Um, quick history, um, this, this piece of land was purchased over 40 years ago and there have been different organizations that have done farmer development activities uh, since then. Uh, it was converted to organic back in 1992 and ALBA was finally founded in 2001, so we've been around 13 years. Um, we picked up another piece of land um, up in Las Lomas, uh, about 30 miles away. Uh, in 2003, and that was another 60 acres of organic land. So we have 150 acres of land, which is a huge blessing and really enables our, act, uh, our activities in creating a, uh, a place where farmers can establish themselves in, in kind of a lower risk environment, um, subsidized access to land and equipment so that their um, initial investment um, requirements are lower than would be otherwise. They also get free technical assistance um, and business assistance uh, in our incubator. But yeah, just getting to our core services, in years one to two, we're doing a farmer education program that starts with a year of a lot of classroom instruction and some farming experience on a demo plot. The second year is um, really kind of testing their commitment to farming on a half acre, seeing if they like it and whether or not they're ready to enter our incubator. Should they be invited um, to enter our incubator, they get another few years on our land where they can scale up to five acres and uh, we start helping them transition off um, at that point to independent farming. And the third core element to our, to our service is the food hub itself, which I'll talk more about. And basically that's providing them market access um, through uh, Albor Organics, which is our licensed produce distributor that uh, is within our nonprofit. So, whoops, went one too far. There we go. So, why a food hub? Um, and this is kind of a, uh, a perpetual question on the board level. Should we be doing this at all? Should we just be focusing on the education and providing that access to land and, and services? Um, should we be dabbling um, in, in, uh, in marketing on behalf of the farmers? And the, the answer to that question is basically, uh, we need to. Uh, to have a shot at viability, farmers really need this access to market um, to expect um, someone who may have, yes, agricultural experience, but has not really managed a business, has not really managed um, all aspects of a farm, and has not run a business in California. It's really competitive and highly regulated agribusiness industry. Um, to expect them to also market perishable product as they're learning all these things is just too much to expect. And plus the, uh, the, 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 the industry does not really cater to the small growers um, and tends to not treat them very well. Um, so it was decided they need protection. They need this uh, market access. It's their choice to market through us. They can go to farmers markets. They can sell direct. But most opt to sell through um, Alba just because it's convenient um, and they've got a lot of other things going on. The learning curve is very steep. Um, and Alba Organic just quickly has been through several phases. It took a while to sort of get started. Um, we were still small after our first several years, about $500,000. Um, and it was only in 2008, um, for the last five years or so, where we've really been experiencing much faster growth. We went from about 500000 to 
four and a half million. We're now expecting five and a half million in 2014. But during that four-year growth period, we're at 72% a year. And I'd say we're now in, we're in our catch-up phase where we're trying to put um, place put in place staff in the systems and facilities to um, get ready for uh, our next um, phase of growth and just to sort of catch up and uh, make sure that we're operating as efficiently as possible and passing on as much of the revenue to the farmer as possible. Um, in terms of getting established, um, we, we should say we relied very heavily um, on grants, um, largely uh, for our facilities, our, our cooler, um, our, um, um, well, various facil uh, building facilities, infrastructure, uh, we relied on the Economic Development Administration to co-finance those. That's within the Department of Commerce. And for operations, um, co-funding our you know, regular uh, personnel and operational expenses. Other grants uh, subsidize that in the first um, several years. In recent years, we're more self-sustainable. Uh, and we break even through our gross profit, uh, which is uh, now at about $1 million off of $5 million in sales. So, but it did take a while to get to that point. All right, moving on to um, very briefly how our operations works. Um, let's see, the, uh, on our 110 acres site, we have uh, our main, uh, uh, it's kind of a packing shed, basically. It's a small cooler, but it's where the farmers can drop off their product, you know, within 100 to 200 meters of their, their actual land. And we build pallets there, and um, we transfer that product onto Watsonville, which is about, which is about 30 miles away. Um, we deliver from there about 30 to 40 percent of our product. We deliver direct to clients in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is anywhere from Silicon Valley, 50 miles away, to 120 miles away up in uh, uh, Richmond in the East Bay. Uh, the rest is sold to wholesalers who largely pick up from our Watsonville facility. Um, and we uh, purchase from about 80 farmers, um, between 50 and 60 of whom are either current or past Alba farmers. Uh, but overall, 80% of the produce distributed and sold is from current or former Alba farmers. And we try to not dip below that level because we're really, the purpose of Alba Organics is to um, really serve uh, as a market channel for program participants. The, uh, the price to the farmer uh, is a weighted average of the weekly transactions for any given product um, uh, after we take away our 24% our commission, which is um, taken out to cover our operational expenses. Um, we sell to over 100 clients, but, but really that's concentrated in the top 20. And um, uh, in this last couple of years, we've gone from, as I said, quite small to larger. So now we're kind of playing with the big hitters in the industry, distributing to Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, K-Pay, Veritable, Vegetable, which is a whole different ballgame in terms of uh, the level of professionalism that we have to present to the market, quantity, uh, quantity quality, order fulfillment um, to maintain those relationships and their high standards is much more challenging and we're sort of dealing with that now. Um, just noted that we're also um, dealing with some you know, corporate clients and uh, local universities on the institutional side. Um, and we're going to, they, they pay a premium sort of a value our um, mission as well, but they're also higher maintenance. Um, so we're trying to figure out the right balance uh, of clients while, you know, minimizing spoilage and getting the highest price for our farmers. There we go. So, like I said, I was going to share some of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, I've got just a couple minutes, I know. Um, so I'll probably end with this slide. Uh, farmer coordination is an issue. We have a lot of beginning farmers here, and there's cultural issues, um, you know, most of them coming from Mexico, operating a much less formal environment. Um, it's a lot of them aren't market ready. Um, as I said, it's very competitive in this market, and you have to come through uh, uh, to your clients with you know the, the quality and the quantities on a daily basis. Uh, the analogy I use to farmers is it's like we're doing a jigsaw puzzle every day, and everybody has one piece, um, and it's up to us um, to work in a coordinated fashion so that the jigsaw puzzle to fulfill any given order comes together, and that that is a continual challenge. So. Um, and uh, we're always getting new farmers every year, so it's it's that that aspect of it never goes away. Um, product array, um, we are um, we publish a master crop plan every year. Uh, two years ago, we didn't 
do this so much, we we had a suggested crop plan, but everybody had a lot of freedom in growing what they wanted to grow. And what this ended up what ended up happening was that people would grow something like 50 different varieties of products, and um, it was just in small quantities and varying qualities, and it was just too much for us to effectively market. So what we're trying to do is whittle this down to some main product groups that we know our, our main strategic clients want. Um, we allow farmers to grow things outside that, but make it clear that um, it's their responsibility to sell that should they elect to do so. And so, and again, meeting the quality standards and, and meeting the, the daily orders so that we can maintain these client relationships rather than having the door shut and having to pry it open time and time again is a challenge for us. Um, Operations-wise, uh, I mentioned we're both in Salinas and Watsonville, 30 miles apart. That's not ideal. Uh, we have to aggregate product in one place, load it up, transfer it, unload, and reload for individual clients, which requires more time, extra staff, more overtime, so not exactly cost efficient. Um, staffing, uh, we went from uh, four staff to 10 in the last few years and have experienced a lot of turnover, which is quite disruptive. So we're still putting together a team um, that's for the long haul. Um, our inventory system, uh, a new one was purchased three years ago. It was not tailored to the produce industry and that has caused us a lot of headaches. So we're going to purchase a new one very soon. Um, running an IT network in a, a rural area that uh, performs well with our Watsonville facility has also been a challenge. So um, we're dealing uh, with that um, as well. And then uh, on the marketing side, um, maintaining relationships with the big players like Whole Foods, who have very strict standards, um, is still relatively new to us. Um, uh, so we're uh, all the more reason to improve our curriculum and improve the level of coordination we have and the field quality control that we have. Um, and ultimately targeting an array of strategic clients um, and a manageable one. Maintaining 100 client relationships isn't really manageable, uh, but maintaining uh, 20 to 25 who value small, local, sustainable uh, production and also value our, our, our mission of uh, creating economic opportunity for um, small family farms um, is, is really what we want to target. Okay. Um, the last slide here kind of touches on things I think I've already touched on. These are some of the things that we've, we've, we've done to address the issues on the previous slide. Um, the big thing in uh, issue in motion is about reconsolidating our operations. You'll see a couple bullets down. Um, next year we want to make a move back to Salinas out of Watsonville. We want to um, invest money into our current cooler to basically cool the whole footprint. Uh, and increase the amount of capacity that we have in one location. Um, any spillover we have in coming years, um, should we continue on this growth path, um, we anticipate can be handled through a third-party cooler in Salinas about 10 miles away. That way we um, just run a much more efficient operation, bring um, kind of the brain trust, the general manager and the sales manager back to our operation in Salinas to have better staff oversight and to have better uh, interaction and educational opportunities with the farmers themselves so we can keep tabs on, again, this, uh, this, this challenge of bringing the order fulfillment today on a day-to-day -day basis um, and getting production in sync with marketing, essentially. Um, I think that brings us to about 10 minutes to the hour. And uh, I know there are questions, so uh, why don't I hand it over to Allison? So much, and thank you, everybody. Um, Highly, it was great to learn a lot more about common markets, their regional model, and the wide distribution that you guys have. And Steve and Lyndon, so so much great work, and that we've seen a ton of questions about schools and about the project that you're working on. So I'll definitely get to those. And finally, thank you, Chris, for talking a lot about the market channels for farmers and and some of those challenges and how you have faced those. So as Haile mentioned, we do have a ton of questions coming in. We'll try to get to as many as possible, and I will try to lump a lot of them together. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of questions about price, a lot specifically about schools, community engagement, and food safety. Um, I'll just start off right away with the community engagement question. So 
um, and I'm going to ask, actually I'll start with Haile and just ask all the speakers in order for, to weigh in about what's the process that you use to engage the community, how did you make sure that the Food Hub was part of the vision of the community, and how did you share it with the community? Yeah, absolutely. So we, uh, we really began from a fairly long and extensive uh, planning process. And so that was our first, uh, our first step when we started to have these crazy ideas about launching Common Market. And uh, you know, what we did is we engaged a number of other organizations that were actually doing more of the, uh, let's say, regional food system work, whether it was promoting farmers markets or local food advocates, uh, some of the other hunger relief organizations and uh, held a, you know, a, a long series of focus groups with people. So we really understood the needs of both consumers in several different segments, as well as the needs of different kinds of farmers in our region. So we started with a plan. Uh, we started with participatory planning and direct community engagement. Uh, and again, you know, the, the project really came from the needs of our own community, so partnering with them. And you know, now that we're up and going, uh, we, we, I will say that one of our competencies as an organization, um, we are not a direct service organization, so we don't have, uh, or we don't run community-based programming anymore per se, but uh, the way we uh, connect with community today is through continued partnership with other organizations that do directly engage constituencies in the communities we seek to serve. I'll pass with that. If anybody else wants. Wait. Sure, sure. At Self-Help, um, we're in a unique position because Self-Help really is a civil rights organization that does lending. All of our borrowers really are um, entrenched in their communities and we do a lot of work um, to, to build our relationships with those borrowers and in turn um, we often see a great return in terms of um, them bringing their community partnerships back to us. And so with my background in public health, I, um, I, I like to make sure that everything we do here is really based on the community participatory model where we go in and ask um, the community members what it is that, that they're looking to do and then we work in partnership with them to make it happen. And this is Steve. I think one of the big questions we look at all these food projects is what returns are you prioritizing? And you know, as Chris talked about, you know, ALBA has a different mission sort of criterion than common market. And we just try to make sure that our programming is very much geared towards the theory of social change that's there and what are the returns we're trying to get. I mean, just very briefly to add to that, I mean, because our model is different, uh, you know, we're serving the farmer. Um, these are farmers who are low income, um, and we owe it to them to find the best, you know, markets possible, minimize any any spoilage, and make sure that they're getting, you know, as high payment as possible they, they can for their hard work. Um, so that being the model, um, there's not a lot of we, have, you know, activity here, activity there. People know us um, in the community and support our activity, but there isn't. Um, uh, that's not our priority is continually engaging um, the community. We, we engage the community of farmers all the time to tweak our methods to explain what we're doing and why. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's a bit of a different approach. So I wanted to ask the question about pricing, and I've seen this come through in many different ways. So I'm going to ask the question to all three of you again, starting with Hailey. So some of the questions we've gotten are about how do you price the food and determine the price of food? And how do you balance this tension between trying to keep the farmer well supported and also make food more accessible and affordable for consumers? Yeah, totally. Uh, and I've been trying to answer as many of the questions on uh, on the portal as possible. So for folks, uh, check check there for some of these answers. Uh, first and foremost, we let farmers set their pricing. Uh, and we encourage them to price their product in a way that is, is um, worker supporting, farm supporting, family supporting. Uh, and then we, um, you know, we really let the market respond to that. And we coach our farmers when we think their pricing is too low. Uh, and then also let them know that we're willing to work with them and try to push slightly higher prices. Um, but also, you know, if, if things are, are too high, that often the product won't move. So there's a, a balance there. Uh, you know, the piece that people often leave out when talking about that dynamic tension between um, farm side pricing and consumer pricing is, is also that spread in between that enables uh, thriving, sustainable 
organizations like ours. Uh, and so for us, a big part of that is trying to run um, an efficient organization at a reasonable scale uh, that allows us to reach price points and you know, maintain low price points for our different uh, customer segments. So it is, it is hard. It is, you know, there is, with every pricing decision, dynamic tension. Um, and we also think that um, you know one of the things we really promote and try to convey to people is that we're not we're not in the business of cheap food. We are selling food with values, uh, food that is sustaining families, uh, food that is um, higher quality, food that repairs our our regional environment, and it's food that should cost a little more than um, you know some of the subsidized food that we see in the supermarket. So. Um, we don't, we don't try to be a low-cost competitor. We, we promote food with values, and we try to make that food affordable. Oh, hi, I'd love to talk to you about um, how you do this. Uh, this is a big issue uh, for us at Alba, I, because farmers, especially in the summer when, when production goes way up and prices dip, and we're basically out there in the market. Um, trying to move their product, um, and, and sometimes at times when it doesn't even make sense to generate orders because the cost of harvest is more than they can um, receive in the market. So um, we they've asked, fix our prices so we know what's coming, and we say to them, we're in no position to do that because the market is so competitive, and all we can do is go out there in the market, maintain you know relationships with client clients, and try to get the best price that we can. Um, and sometimes that price is just, you know, it's just not satisfactory. And I think that's, we tell them that's, that's a fact of farming. Um, but if there is a model whereby you have a little bit more control over, um, over, uh, over the price that you can demand and, and you allow the farmers to set those prices, we'd be very interested to know. Uh, you know, we used to, when we had smaller vol uh, sales volume, be able to um, get higher prices for the product. The reason why is due to the smaller volume, we could move all or most of the product in in local, you know, retail, uh, uh, you know, direct buying situations where you can demand a higher price. But now that the volume is gone so high, so much higher, um, and we have to we're pressed to move the product in a hurry before it spoils. Um, we we have to take lower prices. Uh, for instance, I recently did an analysis on our berries. Um, you know, the price we can get through our, some of our local kind of boutique um, organic uh, retail chains is up to 50% higher than what we can get through a, a wholesale channel. The problem is we just can't move that much volume through those higher price channels. Um, and we have to rely on that, that wholesale outlet. Um, so um, I think this is a great topic for another, another discussion. This is Steve. I mean, I think there are a couple things. Something has to give. You know, especially for mission-driven organizations that want to pay livable wage to their employees and make food accessible. And I think that's, um, I'm obviously going to go there. This is a great role for community development finance to collaborate uh, with public and private entities to find the ways of reducing the fixed cost, you know, ways of, of making that basis smaller. Some of the really creative uh, food hubs we've seen co-share locations. Uh, to get tenants to help bring down their occupancy costs that they're able to do things of that nature. Um, uh, if we had time, obviously, for a longer webinar, I could tell you a number of innovative things that Common Market does to, that I had never heard of before that I thought were really radical and really impressive in terms of giving them the financial basis to achieve their mission. So um, needless to say, I'm, I'm happy to share some of the things that we've seen out there in the field. Highly can speak about what they're doing in Philadelphia, but I'm happy to speak about some of the other food hubs that we've seen that do things uh, that allow them to make their food accessible and also pay their employees uh, uh, fair wages. Well, thank you all so much for that. It sounds like we do, in fact, need to regroup and have a webinar on pricing. I continue to see many questions asking about this, this issue. Um, I'm going to end with a very last question with a minute left for uh, Chris. Folks wanted to know if farmers can graduate out of the program and if they're able to either purchase their land or make long-term lease agreements. And finally, somebody wanted to know if you offer technical assistance outside of your area. Um, that's uh, good questions. Um, with regard to uh, transitioning off and, and how people usually find land, this is an area that we're, we're developing services for, these transition services and 
trying to um, anticipate you know, their departure a year or two ahead of time to start introducing them to landowners, working with a local nonprofit called California Farm Lake to help uh, find land. They specialize in that. Um, and, uh, and usually, um, because banks aren't super anxious to do um, uh, you know, lend to farmers in general, but certainly not, certainly not uh, micro-sized farmers, um, they, they get into leases. Um, uh, and those are often year to year, sometimes a little bit longer term. Um, it's a problem, though, because uh, land availability, particularly small parcels of land, organic land, in the Salinas Valley or thereabouts um, are not common. So uh, we've, we've got to develop our own network and rely on other uh, you know, um, organizations that specialize in this area. Um, and the second question was, I'm sorry? Oh, it was about whether you work outside of your region or provide technical assistance. A little bit here and there. We are um, among a few organizations that are funded by the um, National, let's see, Incubator Farmer Training Initiative out of Tufts University. Uh, and we do some remote training and, and do webinars through, through that. Um, it's a very small activity. And frankly, um, we don't have a whole lot of time. We're pretty well stretched with our, we're just, just serving our own farmers. Um, so the answer is a little bit. Okay, great, thank you. Well, I'm going to wrap up and thank everybody. Uh, thank you for sticking with us for a minute after the hour. This was a great informative webinar, and I see from the